Good morning, everybody. Glad that you're here, and thank you, Holly and Richard. Thank you for preparing us, and it's so exciting. If we listen to those words, a lot of them were summaries of what we've learned already, as well as a preparation of what we'll be covering today. And that's the beauty of music that has the Word of God in it. We get to see how it intertwines. Well, anyway, I'm grateful to be able to have this opportunity to share when Beth asked me, um, and I first saw the lesson and I read it, I thought, oh boy. And then I thought, I read it again, oh boy. And I read it again, and then finally I thought, bang, I think I see it. So I'm so excited to be able to share with it. Now, the thing is, I feel like whenever I'm asked to uh, do a study, it's for me. It's for me to learn something, so I'm simply going to share with you what I've learned, but I love this lesson. So I hope and pray you do too. And we're, I'm so grateful for Beth and Dina preparing us as we've studied Elijah and Elisha. Now, a lot of people say, I get the two guys confused. Well, here's an easy way to remember them. Elijah is J. And that comes before Elisha, which is S. So Elijah is our first uh, character that we've been studying, and he's the one who will be discipling Elisha. But I'm going to throw a curveball in in the lesson and give you their Hebrew names, so that will really confuse you. But anyway, let's just stick with Elijah and Elisha. With that being said, as we've studied, we saw that Elijah was a man just like us. He's no different. He was born the same way we were born. He was raised in a Jewish culture. In fact, everybody in the scripture is Jewish, except for Luke. You know, so this is the amazing thing, that this is a Jewish story taking place in Israel, the Jewish nation. And so we see that God grew Elijah just like he wants to grow us. It's day by day, minute by minute, activity by activity, learning, growing. And this is what we're going to cover. When we think about the times in which Elijah and Elisha lived, they were very similar to our world today. And nothing's changed. These were times that were good times, and these were horrible times. They were the worst of times in fa due to the fact that the culture was corrupt, the king was corrupt, the kingdom had become corrupt, most of the leaders had become corrupt, and they bowed down to idols that had demonic associations. They weren't just statues. They had demonic associations. They were worshiping the demon world. So that's the worst of times. But here's the best of times. God showed up. God showed up through Elijah to call the people back to himself. You know, Ezekiel 33 says, God takes no delight in judging the wicked. He wants them to return to him. And that's what he does when he raises up prophets to call people back to him, confront their wicked ways, but call them back to him. And we saw that Elijah did this on Mount Carmel. I think it was Beth that taught that lesson. No, it was Dina. Anyway, they're both great. Anyway, with that being said, um, there's the contest. But it took years of preparation to come to that point where he would stand up against 850 false priests of demonic uh, Baal worshippers. And God showed up on Mount Carmel to show that he's the true God. Now, we know from biblical history that God chose the nation of Israel to be in covenant relationship with him so, to, that, so that together they would provide light to the world, both by following God's word as well as bringing forth the Messiah who would be the true light of the world. Now, that road to redemption was not easy. There were 400 years in Egypt which eventually enslaved the people 
But God raised up Moses to deliver his people, and he brought them to Mount Sinai, in which he betrothed them to himself in a covenant relationship. After 40 years in the wilderness, God led them to the border of the promised land, and this is what he said to them. I've given you this land. Now go fight for it. Whoa. He gave me the land that I got to fight for it? They had to fight for it by overcoming the evil forces which had occupied the land. So God was going to bring judgment that those nations had been a part of for 400 years. He was going to bring judgment on them by sending his people in them to fight for the land God was giving them. Now that land of Canaan was very corrupt, as we saw under Jezebel and Ahab, but it preceded that. This land was full of idolatry, which I said had associations with demonic powers. It was full of injustice, corruption. It was full of infidelity, adultery. They had male prostitutes and female prostitutes in temple areas. It was full of indulgences. They abused people for their personal gain. And worst of all, indifferences to the extent that they sacrificed their children to these false gods, Baal and Moloch. Those tall statues with outstretched arm that had demonic uh, figures on their faces held out the arms for those people to bring their babies where a burning pot of fire was underneath those arms and they'd lay those babies to burn to death while they played drums so they wouldn't hear the cries. This is the land in which God wanted to judge, but also to bring light to why he raised up leaders. We saw that as Israel went into the land, they didn't conquer at all, but yet God brought forth the United Kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon. And under Solomon, he started marrying foreign women who had these pagan practices, and Solomon, brought it to Jerusalem. Thus his divided heart led to the divided kingdom in which we learned about as we studied Elijah and Elisha. Ten tribes to the north were called Israel, two tribes to the south were called Judah. And our study takes us in that northern part of the kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel. Thus enters Elijah. Would you pray? with me as we review what we've studied so far and we unpack 2 Kings 3. Lord, we heard the song, Word of God Speak. And Lord, I want to add a phrase. Lord, help my ears hear. Because we know that you speak. You speak through your word. You speak through songs. You speak through people, but Lord, help us hear what you want us to hear today as we unpack your word. For this we pray in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, Beth prayed over me for holy saliva, because I get so dry. Beth, I think I need you up here again. Anyway, <laughs> here we go. So before we unpack 2 Kings 3, let's review some valuable lessons. One, Elijah was a man just like us. Now his Hebrew name was Eliyah. Eli, God, Yah, Yehovah. Yah is his short name for My God is Yahweh. My God is Yehovah. That's what Elijah means. See, there's no J in Hebrew. That's an English translation. So Eliyah. Well, where was Eliyah from? He was from Tishba. Elijah the Tishbaite. Well, where in the world is Tishba? Well, as Chuck Swindoll said, it was in the middle of Nowheresville. <laughs> so in essence, God chose Eliyah, Elijah, from Nowheresville to be a man that he would partner with to bring light to this dark world. Point one, God will transform anyone 
even if they think they're no one, to be someone to partner with him. Isn't that exciting? God will, not might, not could, not can, God will transform anyone, even if we think we're a no one, to be someone who will partner with him. Now, how does this happen? It's not easy. The transforming process to make a no one into a someone is called discipleship. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is an apprentice. A disciple is someone who chooses to spend time with the master to learn his teachings, but also to become like the master. See, it's one thing to learn the teachings. This is another thing to become like the master because of the teachings. When we think of Elijah, or Eliyah, my God is Yah, God transformed him through the discipleship process. Here's another word from Chuck Swindoll. He used Camp Kareth. Camp Kareth. Camp Kareth. It's a boot camp. Remember when he took Elijah out of the limelight and put him in Nowheresville, so to speak, at Kareth, so that he would learn to depend on him, and God gave him water through the brook Kareth and food from the ravens. Now, the way things are going with food prices, we may end up needing <laughs> God to provide ravens at our door. But I think these lessons are not just historical stories. They're to increase our faith. This happens, and I, this wasn't in my notes, but Beth prayed for me that if something wasn't in my notes and God brought it to say it, okay, Beth? So this is on you. Anyway, with that being said, <laughs> this happens. If you remember when North Korea invaded South Korea, well, there was, well, how many years ago was that? I don't even know if I was born. But anyway, with that being said, there was this little man who had become a Christian through missionaries, and he had a wife and two daughters, and food had run out. Everything was run out. He had no food. And he went to his uh, knees and said, Lord, you promised to provide for your people. I'm asking you to provide. We're out of food. And he said, it seemed like the Lord said, go fishing. He said, where? There's no water. I'm in inland. The rice paddy. Go fishing in the rice paddy? He went out with his little make-believe fishing pole, and he caught a fish every day to feed his family till food supplies were provided. So see, these things happen in real life when we know the biblical story for God to show up. Camp Kareth. This is boot camp. This is part of discipleship where we go through experiences. We go through circumstances that help increase our faith and trust God. But then after Camp Kareth, we move on to the next level of discipleship called Crucible Serapheth. God took Elijah from Brook Kareth, Camp Kareth, and sent him to Zarephath, Gentile territory. On the other side of the, he had to go through Ahab's territory up to what is Lebanon today, uh, up there to a widow, an impoverished widow. <sighs> Doesn't make sense. But anyway, he obeyed, and through crucible seraphath, because seraphath means to melt like a refiner's fire. He went into the refiner's fire. He had to have his life, his faith refined more and more to trust God, to go to what would have been the enemy of God, the Gentiles, to an impoverished woman, which wasn't really kosher, and God provided their miracles, and he started his miracle ministry through crucible seraphim. So here's point two. God transforms us through discipleship. 
And remember, discipleship is learning not only the teachings of the master, but becoming like the master so that we can be partners with the master. And many times that's going to involve camp careth to learn how to depend on God. That's our belief. And then crucible seraphith, refining our faith. Oof. Getting rid of not what doesn't look like him and developing the things that look more like him. Now, it helps me when I remember that my faith journey and my growth is a process. Oh, how I wish it would happen overnight. In fact, I thought it did. When I became a Christian at age 17, the person said to me, oh, you're a new creature in Christ. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. And I thought, yippee, I'm different. <laughs> well, 70 years later, you know, um, it's been a process. And that's the whole idea of discipleship transformation from one degree of glory to another. Like Elijah, who is just like us, I have to go through Camp Kareth. I have to learn to trust God. I have to go through Crucible Seraphith in order to be refined and defined so that I can stand up against the evils and corruption of my times. Elijah's journey led him to the showdown of the demonic forces at Mount Carmel to show that there is only one God. It took years of preparation to get him to this place where he would face that battle. And as a result, his confidence in God was strong. His refining process allowed him to want the glory of God instead of self-promotion. And he stood there firm, and God showed up in the fire, burning up the offering on the altar to which all the people bowed down and said the Lord Yahweh is God the Lord Yahweh is God whenever you see capital L capital O capital R capital D that's Yahweh Yehovah the covenant God who is who was who always will be point three God alone is the one true God, Yahweh. In the Hebrew, it's Yod, He, Vav, He. In the English, it's Y, H, V, H. Now, the English translate it Jehovah, but there's no J in Hebrew. Or Yahweh, but there's no W in Hebrew. So I like the Y, H, V, H. You know why? Because every letter is the sound of breath. Yo, hey, fa, hey. Breath, spirit. So that's Elijah, or Eliyah. Now let's go to Elijah. Elisha. Elisha's name means Elisha, God is my salvation. My God is salvation. There is no other. That's Elisha. Elisha was just an ordinary guy doing ordinary work. He was plowing his field with 12 oxen. And some think Elisha was 15 years old when Elijah threw his cloak around him. And there is something about that cloak, that garment, that mantle, because after Elijah puts that garment on Elisha, the Bible says, Elisha left everything and ran after Elijah. He went to Elijah and said, let me go say goodbye to my parents, and then I will come with you. Now, this is the call of discipleship. Now, what was that cloak like? And this is where we will see on the screen the prayer shawl. I've mentioned this before about the prayer shawl. This is the updated version. But in Numbers 15, God commanded the Israelites to wear the prayer shawl. God designed the prayer shawl for them to wear. Why? Because each time they would look at the tassels, they would remind themselves to obey God's commands. They would remind themselves to be consecrated to God alone. 
And when you add up the number of knots on each of these tassels, the numerical value comes out to be Yahweh, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. In other words, when they put on the prayer shawl, I hope this doesn't affect the mic, they're covering themselves with God's word. They're covering themselves with God's name. They're covering God's, themselves with God's spirit. Because each letter of Yahweh is the sound of spirit, breath. And in the Greek, when it's translated, prayer shawl, it's prayer closet. This is their prayer closet. Thus the Jewish men today wrap themselves in the prayer shawl to pray to the one true God, the God of Israel. Now that's what I think Elijah threw that prayer shawl on Elisha to say, you're the next anointed with God's word, God's name, God's spirit. And that's point four. God's name, which is his person, God's word, and God's spirit is our mantle, is our covering, is our prayer shawl to remind us to obey God's word, to remind us to be consecrated to God. And after this, it says Elisha burned his plows, cooked the meat of the oxen, ate with his family and community, and then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. And Elijah discipled Elisha, and he prepared him for God's assignment on earth while Elijah would be taken to heaven. And what did Elisha ask of Elijah? A double portion of his spirit, as Beth taught last week. And Elijah's request showed his humility because he knew that he was weak within himself and needed all of God to be partners with God. And as we learned last week, God answered him. For when Elijah was taken up by the chariot of fire into heaven, he threw his prayer shawl off for Elisha to pick up as a remembrance, to be covered with God's word, to obey God's word, to be covered with his name, to be covered with his spirit. And remember, Elisha was just an ordinary man doing ordinary work. Elisha left all to follow God and be trained by Elijah. Elisha was faithful to the discipleship process. Elisha didn't compete. Elisha didn't compare with Elijah. In fact, he wanted to be like Elijah. He loved and respected Elijah, that he wept when Elijah was taken from him. And he received that double portion, and then he got up, and he started the mission to which God had called him. So, that's review. Now let's get on to today's story. <laughs> Nothing that happens today would have happened without all that preparation. The preparation of Elijah, the preparation of Elisha, and it was years to get to 2 Kings 3. So, let's read 2 Kings 3, 1 to 10. Jehoram, son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and his mother, for he put away the pillar of Baal that his father had made. Yet he continued the idolatrous sins of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin, and he didn't depart from them. Mesha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he used to pay tribute to the king of Israel, a hundred thousand lambs and the wool of a hundred thousand rams. But when King Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. King Jehoram left Samaria at that time and assembled all the fighting men of Israel. Then he sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go up with me to fight against Moab? Jehoshaphat said, Sure, I'll go with you. I am as you are. My people is your people. My horses, your horses. Jehoram said, Well, which way should we go? 
Jehoshaphat said, uh, let's go through the wilderness of Edom. The king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. They made a circuit of seven days journey and there was no water for the army or the cattle. Then the king of Israel said, oops, we're doomed. For the Lord has called the three kings to be handed over to Moab. Now here's some observations. None of them inquired of God. None of them. Well, we knew the king of Israel wasn't going to do it, but Jehoshaphat knew better. He didn't inquire of God. He said, sure, I'll go with you. I am as you are. My people, your people. My horses, your horses. This is covenant language. This is what covenant is all about. What's mine is yours. He wasn't in covenant with the king of Israel. They were at odds with each other. And yet he formed this alliance with Edom, who was their enemy, to go against Moab. Doesn't make sense. But anyway, none of them inquired of God. And then the king of Israel said, well, uh, which way should we go? And Jehoshaphat said, let's go through the desert. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, let's go down to the end of the desert, go over this way. Okay, now none of them inquired of God. They're in the desert, seven days, no water. And then Jehoshaphat says, uh, maybe we should ask God. Okay, here's point five. We are to seek God's guidance first before making a plan. We are to seek God's guidance first before making a plan, especially in covenant relationships where you give your whole self to it. That's to be a God thing. So we're to seek God's guidance first. Another observation, notice what the king of Israel said. Uh, God's against us. And he's going to turn us over to Moab. Many times, if we don't pray and ask God's will when we do something, we're prone to think, God isn't for me. God's against me. God's punishing me. See, when all it had to be done was ask what God's will was, then when things aren't going exactly as you think they ought to be, you have the confidence you had God's plan. And he'll show up. So let's go on to verses 11 to 15, because we're going to get to the good stuff, okay? Right with me? Jehoshaphat said, is there a prophet of the Lord? Notice, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh. Is there a prophet of Yahweh here that we may inquire of him? Well, one of the servants of the king of Israel said, Elisha is here who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Jehoshaphat said, oh, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, and the king of Edom went down to Elijah. And then Elisha said to the king of Israel, hey, what do I have to do with you? Go back to the prophets that your mother and your father taught you all about. But the king of Israel said to him, no, for the Lord has called us together, and he's going to deliver us over to the Moabites. But Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's army lives before whom I stand, surely if it wasn't that I respect Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even speak to you. But now bring me a musician. Okay, I scratch my head here, okay? Now bring me a musician. And then it happened. When the musician played the hand of the Lord, came upon him. Ooh, that's pretty powerful. Okay, let's unpack this. First of all, Jehoshaphat woke up in the desert with no water, saying, uh, I think we need to ask God for direction. Is there a prophet that can help us with that? And so he said, where is there a prophet? And I love this, a servant knew. You know, these servants are wiser than kings. They knew where Elijah was. They knew all about Elijah. And he tells them, so the three kings go to Elisha. And notice, Elisha, 
is it real nice here? If it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I really wouldn't deal with you. But I respect him because God's using him. And so Elijah says, hey, call me a musician. And then it happened. When the musician played, the hand of the Lord came, about, came upon Elisha. Now this is what I find interesting. The music of the day was the Psalms. That was their hymn book. That was their song book. That's what they sang. Oh, I have to say this. It wasn't the beep bop ba doop doop It was hymns and psalms. Martin Luther said, the gift of language combined with the gift of song was given to man that he should proclaim the word of God through music. And we heard that this morning. Point six, seeking God's plan will include his word for God speaks through his word. Seeking God's plan will include his word, for God speaks through his word. So, here the music is playing, and the word comes to Elijah what the plan is. 2 Kings 3, 16 and 19. Here's the plan from the Lord. Elijah said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. There again, I scratched my head. Okay, ready? Make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, you shall not see rain, yet the valley will be filled with water so that you, your cattle, your army, your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. Oh, and by the way, he's going to deliver the Moabites into your hand. And when he does, I want you to attack their cities. I want you to cut down their trees. I want you to stop up their water. Notice the Lord gave this plan to Elisha to give to Jehoshaphat for these kings. And the plan was dig ditches in the desert where it doesn't rain. Then after the ditches are dug, they will be filled for the army, the cattle, but there's not going to be any rain. That takes faith, doesn't it? Oh, and wait, there's a bonus. If you dig the ditches, the water will come. If you dig the ditches, I'm going to turn the Moabites over to you. You're going to win the battle. So a lot is contingent on digging the ditches. And Elisha says, this is simple for God to do. Where do you think Elisha learned that? From Elijah. He was trained well through the discipleship process. So let's continue. 2 Kings 3, 20 to 25. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered. That's an offering of gratitude. They gave the grain offering that suddenly water came by the way of Edom, the desert. It came from the desert and the land was filled with water. When all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, they all assembled with their arms and they stood at their border. And then they rose up early in the morning. The sun was shining on the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. They said, this is blood. Those kings had killed each other. Now, Moab, go to the spoil. So when they came to the camp of the Israelites, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them. And they entered their land and did what Elijah had said. They uh, chopped down the trees and they filled up all the water holes for them. Here's the thing. God used the ditches so that the three kings and their army had water and defeat the enemy. 
It's a double win. Point seven. As a disciple, faith is a noun. It's a belief system, the teachings, but it's a verb. It's action. Faith is a noun and faith is a verb. God said, dig the ditches in the desert and he would fill them with water, but not with rain. Faith's part was to dig the ditches. Action. So what would that look like for us today? How would we dig ditches? Well, maybe we could dig deeper in the word of God to study it, to see what God says rather than what somebody else says. Hey, don't take what I say for... Do your study. Dig in the Word of God to see what He has to say. Maybe digging ditches would mean digging into my life. Do some self-examination. How's my attitudes? How's my actions? Have I made amends? Hey, we just came through the Jewish holidays well, yeah, I guess you call them holidays, but the month of Elul, the whole month of August, they did self-examination for a month. How am I in my walk with God? How am I in my relationship with other people? Do I need to forgive somebody? Do I need to make amends? So that when they come to Rosh Hashanah, the head of the new year, they can start the new year having made amends with people, having forgiven people, having made things right. So maybe digging ditches might look like understanding I might be in Camp Kareth where the brook is dry and I have to trust God. Or maybe digging ditches looks like I'm in Crucible Seraphath where I'm being refined because God's carving away what doesn't look like him in order to put things that do look like him. Maybe digging ditches might mean that I still show up for discipleship, Bible study, serving, caring, loving when I feel dry. Because if Israel and Judah didn't obey and dig the ditches, there would not have been a miracle. In closing, oh, I bet you were glad about that, huh? Okay, we're closing now. In closing, I want to look at another valley. And this valley is in Ezekiel 37. This valley, God said to Ezekiel, I want to take you to this valley full of dead, dry bones. And then God said to Ezekiel, I want you to speak to the dead, dry bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, I will put breath in you so that you may come alive and you will know that I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied just as I was commanded to do so. And then there was a noise, a rattling. The bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, there's sinews and there's flesh and skin that covered them. But there was no breath in them. And then the Lord said to me, speak to the breath. Say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come, O breath, Spirit from the four winds, breathe on the slain that they may live. So I, Ezekiel, prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath, the Spirit, came into them, and they came to life, and they stood on their feet, and they became an exceedingly great army. Now, of course, that prophecy was for the nation of Israel, but we've been grafted into Israel, which means this has implications for us today. Sometimes God does his greatest work in the valleys. It happened in 2 Kings 2, and it happened in Ezekiel 37, and it's true today. God speaks through his word, just like he said, speak to the dry bones. And you know what? We can be assembled. We can come together, but we can be dead inside. And then God said, speak to the Spirit to come and breathe the breath of life into them so that they become alive and can stand on their feet and together be an exceedingly great army. Reminds me back in the garden when God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. He was just a bunch of dust. 
and God breathed into him the breath of life, that's when he became a living spirit, a living soul. And then in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says God breathed into his word. So the breath of God is in his word. Charles Spurgeon said, first Ezekiel spoke to the dry bones. That's good teaching. Then Ezekiel spoke to the spirit. That's good praying. And together with the spirit and the word, that's real living that we can stand on our feet and become an exceedingly great army. With all word and no spirit, we can be assembled, yet not alive, without breath. However, with the word of God, the spirit of God, we can stand on our feet. And as we put Elijah's name, meaning Eliyah, my God is Yah, and we put Elisha's name together, Elisha, my salvation is God, we come up with Yeshua, Jesus, who is our God and is our salvation. For Jesus is our salvation. He is our living word. He is our breath of life. And he is calling us to be an exceedingly great army. And here's the battle plan. Carolyn Custance James said, a malnourished faith is no match for the artillery that comes against us in the trenches of ordinary life. It will never do good just to close our eyes, try harder, and try to dwell on happier thoughts. Our faith must be fed, and truth is the only food it can digest. Because faith is a noun, and faith is a verb. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you want to breathe your breath of life in us so that we can stand on our feet. We can stand against the evil forces in our world. We can stand against the evil inclinations of our own heart. We thank you that you want life in us, for us, and with us. For that, we pray you help us cover ourselves with your word, with your name, with your spirit. For this we pray in the name, above all names, the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.